Okay, cool. Oh, you stopped. <laughs> um, hello. <laughs> hello. Hello. Oh, my word. <clears throat> OK. Um, I'm Derek. <laughs> OK, you don't have to do that with everything. <laughs> Just the really funny parts. Um, I'm Derek. I'm going to be talking to you. Um, I. I'm basically, uh, f f first of all, this is being streamed to the internet. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about it. It's a new thing. Um, so, uh, yes, hello, everyone at home, including my girlfriend, my dog, and my cats. So, uh, everyone say, hello, Kansa. Ready? One, two, three, go. Hello, so, that's my girlfriend. Uh, no, that's my dog. <laughs> Um, okay, so I am going to be answering questions. Now, what I generally do two, one of two things. I either talk about myself for half an hour, which, let's be honest, will be the best half hour in your lives. <laughs> and then I spend the second half hour answering questions questions from you guys and from the people at home um, or I just go right into the question and answer session now and anything that I would normally say in my half hour I would seek into that because I'm a professional and I've done this before now one thing we have to keep in mind is spoilers so just so I, I can get a general idea of the audience in here. Who has read the latest book until the end? OK. You, have you all f uh, finished it? OK. Those reading the series, how many have not yet reached the final book? OK. OK, good. Those who haven't read any of the book so far, how many of you are there? <laughs> oh, one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> Suddenly feeling a lot less warm towards <laughs> some of you. Um, but that's OK. That's OK. Um, uh, and at home, if you can raise your hands, if you haven't read, oh no. Okay, so basically we are going to be uh, very conscious of the questions um, we are asking. And, you know, I want to be asking a question about the latest book. You will do so in code, okay? <laughs> I don't know what kind of code. Where each person is going to make up your own code, even if it's a, you know, uh, <clears throat> what, you know, and then with that, ah! <laughs> you know, so basically it might become a kind of a miming thing. So that's going to be fun. We're going to be also videotaping you, and that will be broadcast over the world. <laughs> so you look like idiots. Um, hey. <laughs> Uh, and so just for the viewers at home, we will be trying our very best. And for those of you here, we will be trying our very best not to spoil anything for you. But there is no, there's no guarantee, OK? So basically, if I go earmuffs, you block your ears, OK? All right. Does anyone have a question? <gasps> you have a question. Is it a spoiler question? No. No. Wonderful. Ask a question. Where did you get the idea of having a skeleton detective for the young girl? Uh. <laughs> Spoiler. <laughs> How did you know he was a skeleton? I, I, I. Um, OK, the, the idea. As a writer, 
I leave myself open to ideas wherever they may manifest. My imagination is my world. And a lot of the time, when an, an idea pops into your head, it's, it's a little germ of an idea. And it, it comes to you and you go, that's interesting, and you file it away. And over time, you build on it, and the germ of an idea becomes something larger, and then you add to it, and, and, and you, you take the time to, to nurture it, and it becomes a workable idea. And then that's just the start of it, because then you have to approach it from your own, your own unique perspective, and how can I take an idea? Because ideas don't really mean a whole lot, it's how you execute the idea, that's the important thing. So that's usually how it happens. Um, so for something like skullduggery, if that were my process, you would expect that I thought skeletons, they're pretty cool. Um, what can I do with that? And OK, skeleton might lead me to skull. My, ooh, skullduggery, that's a name. Excellent. And, and then, um, so what, I'll, I'll, you know, then you dress them in a suit and you give them magic. And, so that would normally be the process for any idea. But skullduggery was different. So skullduggery, oh, there's new people. Hello. Hi. Um, there are, so skullduggery kind of popped into my head all of a sudden. And I, it, it was 2004 maybe five, because um, I had started out writing movies. Um, I, I wrote two small Irish films um, that didn't really break through, um, uh, but still, that was my sign that I was a writer. You know, I had two films made. Um, but I was in London to meet with uh, producers to try and get my third film made. Um, and the idea popped into my head, and it was it, his name, Skullduggery Pleasant, arrived into my head. It told me everything about him, who he was, what he was, what he was like. I saw him as a tall skeleton in a suit with the fedora, dressed like a private eye from the 40s. All of those black and white movies that I used to love as a kid, whenever they came on a rainy Saturday afternoon, and I would sit down, and I would, I, I, I would just um, absorb them. Because as a kid with a stammer, I was never able to speak fast. And suddenly, I was watching these movies with all these detectives, with Humphrey Bogart, you know, with, with Cary Grant. You know, everyone, you know, it was a film noir and screwball comedies. And that's their style. They talk really fast, they're hyper-intelligent, uh, and they look awesome. And so that became, so when I knew that this is how Skullduggery looked, I went, okay, so he's a detective, and he's this kind of personality. And so it just, that was it. It was a, a, a moment that literally changed my life. His name changed my life. So I'm quite grateful for that. Um, anyone, anyone else? Oh, yes. Um, OK, the names for the characters. Coming up with names, <laughs> it can be easy, OK? When I came up with Skullduggery Pleasant, five names popped into my head. Ghastly Bespoke, Mr. Bliss, Serpine, China Sorrows, and Tanith Lowe. Five names plus Skullduggery, uh, names that told me who these people were. Um, they told me everything I needed to know a personalities. Not their street, but their personalities. I knew China's Sorrows was beautiful. 
I knew she was the femme fatale, you know, I knew she was the mysterious one, the one with all, all the secrets. Um, I, I knew he was just scarred, um, but decent. Um, and Serapine obviously was the bad guy. Um, <laughs> And, and that was fine. So I, I, when I came up with the idea for Skullduggery, and I was in terrible hotel room, um, the only one I could afford, uh, in the middle of Piccadilly Circus uh, in London. Um, and it was the height of summer, and it was so oppressively hot in that room. Um, and the room, I, I can still see it. The, the bed was there, the door was there, the window was b behind me. There, there, was not, there was no desk. You know, there was no, you know, there was nowhere I could sit and write. So I knelt by the bed and I got out my notebook and I wrote Skullduggery Pleasant. And then I wrote China Stars and Galaxy Bespoke and all this. And I looked at these six names and I thought, you know, if it's going to be a story, this is going to be a book um, full of, of people with really unusual names, then for those of you who don't know, a bird has just tried <laughs> to enter this event, um, smashed against the window and has died. <laughs> so take a moment to think about the bird. This stupid bird <laughs> who wanted so much to be a part of this. I really appreciate all of my fans. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just getting emotional. Um, um, what was I saying before the bird rudely interrupted me? Um, so, uh, names. To, to, I, I literally have forgotten what I was saying. Something about birds. Yes, li yes, kneeling on the floor, um, writing these things down, and I figured if I was writing a story full of these people who, who had these unusual names, first of all, I have to figure out why they have unusual names. Is this a world in which everyone has an unusual name? No, because that's going to be really awkward, and the, if everyone has a cool name, the cool name stop being cool. So then you go, okay, no, then it's a subset of a world. And maybe a, a community beneath the world we know. And then it goes, okay, well, then why? Well, Skullduggery is a walking skeleton, so he's magic, and maybe all of these people are magic. Maybe they're all sorcerers. So every, every step I was taking to figuring out my initial idea told me more about the world and told me more about what story this was that I was, I was actually about to start writing. Um, so I was kneeling there, okay, so they're sorcerers, it's a hidden world, you know, hiding from, from they're keeping it secret from uh, the mortals. Um, okay, cool, awesome. And, you know, so every sorcerer is going to have an awesome name. So this is easy because I've got six names that just popped into my head, and obviously it's going to continue like that, because it's so simple, and it's, it stopped being simple pretty much immediately. So what I do, that same notebook I still have at home, and I, it is full of scribbled names that could become words, or words that could become names, or just um, obscure names. The lovely thing about doing signings um, is that I get, when they hand over the, the books, there's always their name written on a post-it note, so I won't have to ask, how do you spell your name? Um, and it makes me look really intelligent, because, oh, I, I know how to spell this name. John. <laughs> is, is that foreign? I have no idea. Um, uh, but what I, what I, invariably, in any large group of people, there would always be at least one person with a cool name. And so I've got in my notebook full of scraps of paper, it's 
full of uh, post-it notes that I have taken from, from signings. So um, yeah, so whenever I need a name, if a name hasn't just popped into my head, um, I'll go, okay, this post-it note and this scroll here. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's not as easy as I'm making it sound because the difficult thing is to come up with one of these cool names and not to have it self-consciously cool. Because that's, if it's too cool, then you're going, right, you know, they become instantly forgettable. Uh, whereas if it's, there's a certain rhythm and there's a certain uh, poetry to combining two words or two names into a character uh, that I cannot explain, uh, but it's there. And when I, I know it when I hear it. So, yeah. um, yes, with the hair? Yes. Okay. Codes. Okay. 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 Certain something turns into a certain something. Turns into a certain something. I'm um, translating for the people at home. Yes. Okay. Um, what do you think that certain something's favorite cheese would be? Okay, okay, good, good, good. <laughs> so for those at home who didn't hear, in the latest book, a certain something changes into a certain something. And the question is, what does that certain something that results, uh, what is their favorite cheese, and also the cheese of the certain something that accompanies the aforementioned something. Um, cheddar. Mild ch cheddar, you know, you know, maybe verging onto red cheddar, you know, you know, if it's a Friday and they're feeling, uh, um, yeah, 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 boom, cheddar. Also, it's the, really the only cheese I know. Yes. Are there any characters that you wish they had another name? So, like, you call some, like relevance, you wish they you'd give it some another name. Okay, okay. Uh, and again, for those who have not heard that. Um, any characters I wish I had given another name to, like Mevolent or someone like that. Why? Do you hate any of the names? Oh my God, which ones do you hate? Tell me, tell me now. No, no, no. You, you love them all? So they're all awesome? So why do you ask a stupid question? You're sitting in the front row, I could punch you. I'm not going to punch you but also you're wearing sandals and I could accidentally step on your foot. So, you know, you're, I'm just saying you're a very vulnerable position. Um, uh, okay, okay. Any character that I wish I had given another name to? No. Ooh, hmm, mm, yeah. No. Um, but when I, when I came up with, in, uh, in the, in phase two, um, there was a character called a cadaverous. And I came up with cadaverous to be, uh, to basically become like the arch enemy of skullduggery, okay? So I came up with him specifically for this, this task. And I had the name Cadaverous in my head for years, but I, I could never find the, the right um, a character to give it to. Uh, but then, you know, if you're coming up with an arch enemy for Skullduggery, you want an unwieldy name, you know? Um, something that wraps around your tongue when you actually say it. So I thought of, okay, uh, the counterpoint to Skullduggery would be this guy, give him the name Cadaverous, boom, and have him be the arch enemy, and who would, who would uh, torment him from that book onwards. But as is the way with writing, you can never really tell what is going to happen with any of your ideas. So this, this, um, this notion of mine to make him the arch enemy 
it didn't really work on the page because by the time I figured out who he was, he had pretty much established himself as the arch enemy to Valkyrie. So he had a personal vendetta against her, not against Skullduggery. So the purpose, his entire purpose was um, quickly going wrong. And also, I had to take into account the fact that phase two, which is six books long, was originally nine books long. Um, and the middle three were primarily going to deal with the American question. And the American question um, revolved around an American president who was a buffoon. <laughs> and during the, right before the American elections, um, uh, when um, when Donald Trump was running for president, I thought, I thought he's not got a chance. He's, 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 it's going to be pathetic. He's not going to have a chance. But wouldn't it be weird if he won? <laughs> and then so I wrote the book going, OK, I'm going to pretend that this guy somehow managed to win and became president. And so I wrote Martin Flannery to be the Donald Trump kind of character. And as I was doing that, I, was, um, I had planned out the middle three books of, of phase two would be about his, his plans. And he would become gradually more dangerous, but really he would be manipulated by people a lot more intelligent than him. Um, and that was fine what, because I was treating him like a joke. And then Trump won. And that kind of messed up my plans. <laughs> because suddenly he wasn't as funny as I had thought. And so I said, right, I'm not going to give three books to like Donald Trump in disguise. So I kind of, I pr pretty much got rid of that storyline. And uh, so the, the three books on one side, the three books on the other, I had to you know, squeeze together and all of the plot threads with the American trilogy, I would have to uh, deal with and uh, parse out as best I could. And Cadaverous, his, his storyline became one of the victims of that. So, um, yeah, yeah. So this was a name that I'd had in my head for years and going, oh my God, Cadaverous doesn't know who he is, but he's going to be awesome. And then I gave it to a character, and then through uh, circumstances largely beyond my control, I had to, spoiler, kill him. <laughs> um, or end his storyline. So yeah. yeah. OK. Um, OK, at the back. No, you there. Yes, I'm looking at your apples. Nice. Is Skullduggery bisexual? Pretty much. I, because I would be asked this question before. Um, and in the Skullduggery universe, um, uh, it, I've pretty much decided early on that people who are hundreds of years old, who have done everything, who have gone everywhere, who've experimented with whatever there is in life to experiment with. Um, I figured, OK, they would not have the same kind of ideas that we have, that some of us have, about, um, about any kind of, of human sexuality or orientation or whatever. They would pretty much evolve beyond that. Um, uh, and so, but Skullduggery was killed, spoiler, um, uh, when, and I'm trying to remember, I think he was about 120 years old, 
So, uh, and by that stage, he had met his, his wife and was in a very happy relationship. The wife and the child, he had a family, he was set. And so I thought, okay, you know, um, if he had stayed single, then I would know. I would know for certain what he thought about various things and how he felt about various things. Uh, but I thought, okay, so I can say everyone else is bisexual, is pansexual, is whatever. Um, but Skullduggery might have been taken off the market before he had a chance to um, decide for himself. Uh, and so that was fine, and for, for years that was my, my, um, my answer. But then uh, there is a line in Until the End, where in an, a circumstance that I'm not going to go into, when he remarks upon the, um, the physical attractiveness of another man. And um, so that kind of, and, and again, I don't plan these things, but uh, so this is the kind of thing that Skullduggery just says as I'm writing. I'm going, write them. <laughs> Fair enough. You know, I, I'm, I'm in control of a certain amount when it comes to these characters. And then there's a whole, whole, um, whole lot that, that I am told each time I write. And uh, so that is... Um, Pretty much, yeah. He, he, if, if he stayed alive, if he stayed human, and if he hadn't found the love of his life, then uh, yeah, pretty much. He's, he is, at the very least, a pansexual. Yeah, I reckon. And I'm saying that as someone who only has a very rudimentary a grasp of the spectrum of how people feel. I know how I feel. And um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, so when it comes to writing t this stuff, it's kind of my job to reflect the audience, uh, reflect the, the, the readership, to allow them to see themselves in as many of my characters as, as um, I can manage but also to not, as me, pretty straight uh, white guy, like pretty straight. <laughs> what is that really? What is straight? I mean, you know, like Brad Pitt in The Mexican, for God's sake. <laughs> you know, is there a more beautiful, you know, like Harry Styles, for God's sake. Yeah. Look, what a gorgeous man. What? Brian Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds. Like, personality-wise, yes. <laughs> Those eyes, maybe. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's from my point of view, from my limited perspective, I, I try to incorporate as many viewpoints as I can and not insult anyone. So I will probably, in my clumsy, pretty straight white guy way, manage to offend someone, and then I'll learn from that mistake and not uh, do it again, pretty much. So yeah, OK. I, you have your hand up with the cap. Ooh, okay. Again, for the people at home, some of the situations they get into can get pretty dark, and is there a process for deciding how dark I can go? It's called my editor <laughs> and my agent, and sometimes my girlfriend. And they go, Derek, no. <laughs> you cannot do this. Um, yeah. <laughs> I tend to go too far in everything. 
um, and like in, in um, Kingdom of the Wicked, I think, uh, when you have Edgar Kess and, and Mevelyn fighting in the, the town, in the city. And so you've got all these people running, screaming as these superpowered gods punch each each other through buildings, you know. This uh, and I'm having the time of my life, <laughs> right? They're flying, they're blasting each other with I beams. It's real superhero stuff, and I'm loving every moment of it. There is, a, and I've said this before, so some of you may have heard this, but it it is the example that um, perf perfectly encapsulates what I'm saying. In this scene. There's a row of fence posts, like six foot uh, uh, wooden fence posts, that Darkest like grabs uh, one-handed and hurls like a dart, and it hits a uh, malevolent and explodes in an explosion of splinters. Right, and he staggers back, and then she she grabs another fence post and hurls that, and boom, it hits him, explodes, and she does it again and again and again, and each one he's driven back. And that's awesome, right? It's, 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 it's so cool. It would have been so much cooler if Nick hadn't made me change one tiny, practically unnoticeable thing, which is instead of grabbing fence posts with all the screaming people running and hiding and going, ah! Darkest grabbed people. <laughs> and she threw people like darts, and they exploded <laughs> upon Mevelyn's chest. Apparently, <laughs> that was too much for a children's book. So yeah, um, you know, there are other instances where characters get their arms ripped off, and then they're beaten to death with their own fists. <laughs> but I figure, you know, it's fine. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it's, uh, so that side of things, the, the action side, I don't really call it violence, because violence is what we experience as people. We don't experience violence on the screen. We don't experience it in a video game. We don't experience it on a page. That is simulated action. Um, but I can understand why this, you know, this would be a thing. But the, there are other kinds of darkness. And um, because in the books, most of my heroes go really, really dark. As, as a writer, this seems to be a recurring theme that I keep going back to because I love it so much. I adore it so much. I, I think it's a wonderful way to explore who a character is. Um, uh, so we do get quite a dark with you know, revelations and secrets and um, backstories and twists and turns. Uh, but no, uh, my editor and my agent, they have never, never said to me, this storyline is too dark. Because at that point, it becomes, yes, I have most of my readers are people in their 20s or 30s or 40s or like teenagers. But there will always be a constant resurgence of younger readers. Um, and so I've got to keep that in mind. But, but um, with this kind of stuff, if a, if a younger reader is finding it too disturbing, what I've discovered is that they will read it, 
they will absorb the storyline and they go right and they'll just move on until onto the next uh, funny line or the next funny scene um, because that's what we do as people and no matter what age you are um, but you know I as a writer I, 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 I do have an understanding of how dark I can go before it becomes inappropriate for you know and apparently it's all the way dark <laughs> so yeah yeah I, I, I leave the inappropriate stuff for uh, older stories and screenplays where I'm allowed to just go nasty you know so yeah yeah uh, yes miss Um, when it comes to, yes, you're absolutely right. Phase two has a lot of uh, traumatized uh, characters. And you're absolutely right, I'm really good at writing them. Because <laughs> I'm, don't run away! <laughs> no, come back! For those of you who don't know, there's some person who is just running out the door. Oh yes, run, coward! The toilets are just to your right. There you go. <laughs> I love embarrassing people. It's just so much fun. Um, uh, yeah. Basically, um, in phase two, a Valkyrie is suddenly... In phase one, she goes from 12 to 18. In phase two, she is early 20s to mid 20s. Um, and so the story has to, um, the, the story can continue along high octane, energetic, fun and funny and all of the stuff that I love uh, writing about. But Valkyrie is now in her 20s and she has to deal with the consequences of all of the fun stuff that she dealt with in phase one. Phase one when she was super confident arrogant and cocky, right? And she, because why wouldn't she be? She was told that she is awesome, and she was told that she is the coolest, and suddenly she has all these powers, and she's the important one. She's not quite the chosen one, but she's the next best thing. And so, yeah, that's going to go to her head. And in phase one, the Valkyrie I was writing was based on a real person. She's based on a very good friend of mine who is just like her, right? She's six foot tall, she's got long dark hair, she's uh, pretty and strong, and she has that confidence that you don't really find in ordinary people. The uber confidence. The, I walk into a room, I'm the most important uh, person in that room. But because of everything that happened in phase one, she now has to deal with all of the fallout and all of the trauma and all of the consequences of her actions. So in phase two, she couldn't be that arrogant. So I based her on another a girl I knew, my girlfriend. Um, both of the original Valkyries are called Laura. It gets confusing. <laughs> both of them are six foot tall, right? So that gets confusing. Um, I mean, not that I ever get confused, uh, you know. Like, <laughs> Hi, sweetie. <laughs> um, but when all of the, when she had to deal with the trauma of what she had experienced, um, because she was depressed, she had a PTSD, um, she had so much guilt, and so, and, and it just, and she isolated herself for five years. Um, and then she had to deal with it on the page in front of us. And I, I am not a depressed person. I do not s suffer from depression. Um, and so 
there was a point when I didn't really understand what it was. Uh, I thought it was sadness. That's all. I just thought it was sadness. And you know what? Everyone gets sad. We can all power through. And oh my God, how naive was I? Um, my girlfriend as, as suffers from depression. Um, so I have seen her uh, before medication and after medication. And before medication, I could see the spirals. And I could see it's like she just got into a spiral and I could see it coming and she could see it coming. And there's, there's no way to back out of it because it pulled her forward and she just went around and around over the course of a week, just getting more and more introspective, more and more blaming herself for everything, more and more, this is all my fault, this is all my fault, you know, why are you with me, why are you with me, I'm, you know, I'm not worth it, I'm not worth it, and then, you know, and then, boom. So, I watched this again and again, and I researched a little bit about to be a better boyfriend, you know, how, what not to say. Here's a hint, if you know anyone with depression, don't say cheer up. <laughs> That's the wrong thing to say. Um, because it isn't about that. It isn't about cheering up. Um, so I got to witness what it's like from an outsider. Again, from my, honestly, a privileged point of view as a pretty straight white guy who isn't depressed. Um, I got, from my outsider perspective, I got to see what this looked like. I got to, to talk to her every step of the way. And this wasn't about research. This wasn't about um, anything I could use in the book. This was just about coping with the depression. Um, and so I got some kind of a limited understanding what it was like and what it how it was dealt with. Um, so I got to see her before medication, and then I got to see her after medication. And I got to see her, the medication itself, oh my God, that's terrible. That just sinks them even lower. It's awful for a few months. And then they rise back to the surface, and she can see the spirals. You know, that's the weird thing. She can see the spirals when she's, okay, this, normally would set me off and I would just hurtle into that spiral, but now I can see it, it's over there, it'll stay over there, you know? Um, I also, I was, I was speaking to uh, uh, um, psychologist uh, anyway for a different thing, um, and I got to ask him, and he specialized in PTSD, and I said, okay, how do you deal with PTSD? And so he took me through, again, not, not anything intricate, not anything involved, just step by step, every day, how do you deal with someone who has PTSD? How do you get them back? How do you make them see that, you know, the beauty in the world around us? And he took me through it, and so, so that was, you know, that was pure, for me, um, as the writer, uh, to actually apply all of this, which was knowledge that I had gleaned from a living and then knowledge I had actively sought. It just came together. And so, um, I'm, since then, I, in signing cues and in events and stuff, um, I've had quite a lot of people come up and say, um, you know, as far as the sexuality goes, the moment I hinted in one of the earlier books that Ed Tanith was bisexual, uh, I had so many girls come up to me in signing cues and thank you. By the way, thank you so much for doing this. I went, oh, okay, That's, it's a line. You know, it's not a big deal for me, but to them it was everything. And with this stuff, with the trauma stuff, it was the same thing. I had people um, 
come up to me and, and say, you know, um, this got me through this moment, this, this large, you know, year spanning moment. Um, with, with the addiction thing, I, in, the, in the books, she, she a Valkyrie becomes pretty much addicted to a music box that you open it and it plays music and the music soothes all of the angry thoughts and all of the doubts and it just, it, it deadens the thoughts and it has them flat against the ground so they're not spiraling all over the place. But again, they're against the ground. And I had a guy come up and say, I, I went into rehab because of your music box because I realized that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing. And for God's sake, I'm a pretty straight white guy <laughs> without depression. And all of these things are just elements in a book that comes from my imagination. And the power that stories have, the power that, that um, stories have to affect lives, obviously we know about it, we've seen it again and again, how stories can change the world and it can change a culture, but in smaller moments I've seen personally how it can actually help people. So um, it, I, I'm hugely uh, humbled if it is possible for someone as arrogant as me to be humbled um, that the books can actually help people, uh, which is not what I set out to do. So, ooh. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Oh, I have a question. Yes? We've got some questions from the live stream. The live stream, okay. So, yes. James wants to know, have you got any advice for an aspiring author? Any advice? Is it almost three o'clock? <laughs> Seriously? I've answered like four questions. Oh my God. Okay. Uh, yes. Any advice for an aspiring author? Um, write what you know. This is an awful bit of advice. I hated it when I first heard it. Um, I thought it restricted you into doing only what you've experienced and only what, you know, I thought, okay, write what you know. I can only write about a guy who lives at home with his parents, who works on the farm, who writes in his spare time. But no, write what you know. What you are writing about, what a genre, what approach you are taking. Write what you know is you put a bit of yourself into whatever story you are writing. So you have to, it's called emotional honesty. You cannot treat your characters like they are characters in a book or a movie or anything. You've got to treat your characters like they are you. Uh, cut off a slice of your soul, put it into your character and they will become real. And the character is real, the readers will latch on to that real bit. You know, no one knows what it's like to be a skeleton in a suit who is as smart as this guy. But we all know what it's like to be sarcastic and to care about uh, someone and to be angry. So all of those human elements that make up skullduggery, they are the bits we latch on to. And so they're the bits we need to Bring out, okay? Uh, we'll go, we'll go to 10 past. Oh yeah, ten past. We got loads of time. Sweet, yes. Um, from Alice. Hi, Alice. Would I ever write a horror book for adults? Yes. <laughs> I have six months off now. Six months in which I can write whatever I want, that I'm not, my contract starts again next year. So I've got six months that I have carved out that I can write whatever I want until Christmas. And I've just finished, because I asked my publisher, I said, listen, I want a year off before any books, Skullduggery or anything. Um, and they said, yeah. A year off for you. Yeah, let me just do one little thing. Okay. But that's not a year off. Said, yeah, we know, but, but maybe just one little thing. Said, Fine. And they go, well, maybe two little things. That's even better. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so, 
Oh, yeah, I have now done those two little things, and I now have six months in which I can write whatever I want to write. And it will probably be horror for adults, because all of the darkness... My agent had a thing where uh, every time I would send her a screenplay, like, you know, I would take a few weeks and I would write a screenplay. And she'd always kind of take a breath before starting it because she knew after, you know, six, seven, eight months of working on a Skullduggery book and not being allowed to go really nasty, I would put all the nastiness into the screenplay. So she would, oh, dear Lord. So it's all, oh, my God. So, yeah. <laughs> So I'm going to put all of that energy into whatever it is I write next. I don't know what it is. I've got a few ideas, but it's that wonderful bit before you start something where it could be anything. So, yeah. Um, so this is just one more okay. from the live stream. And I think it's probably the most important question. Ooh, yeah. most important question. Would, Go. Um, Would school degree ever wear a cowboy? Yes, and he has in across the, what was that called? Dark plane. The dark plane. Thank you, nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Good, thank you. I need people like you in the audience to remind me of the stuff I've written. Across the dark plane, which is set in 18 something something and it's set in the old west and he has the cowboy hat he has the guns so yeah boom i've already done it and it was so cool yeah yeah okay in the pink where okay the dedications in the books i pretty much got tired of reading books and the no matter how funny the book is the dedication was always too mm, whatever i can literally cannot think of a name what's your name hello alice hi <laughs> to alice um you know that's it yeah that's it it was literally as boring as that you know like even if the book itself was wonderful and involving and funny or horrible and nasty and disturbing, the dedication was always boring. So I figured, okay, I am going to um, treat the dedication as a part of the book. And so it's funny and sarcastic. The dedication is going to be funny and sarcastic. The nice thing about writing a dedication and insulting people is that they're not writers, and they cannot respond. <laughs> so, you know, I, I mean, I, I, to my parents, to my siblings, to my friends, uh, to a girlfriend, twice. Apparently, once was enough. Um, <laughs> what? Uh, the, <laughs> to certain Marvel characters <laughs> who have saved us all. And they should be respected. Um, it got to the point where, see, I don't really know many people because I hate them. <laughs> so I have been like cutting people out of my life for the last 20 years. And so I've, I've run out of people to dedicate the books to. So, oh, geez, I'll dedicate doing this to my, my editor, this to my publicists, to the bin men. That guy who gave me a sandwich once. Um, oh, I, one of them was to uh, a very good friend of mine that I, um, uh, and we, we have been through a huge amount, an awful lot. It, you know, our adventures could f fill a book. And I dedicated it to him. But he doesn't exist. <laughs> I made him up. So I just ran out of people to dedicate it. So I made up a friend. <laughs> and uh, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There. Uh, yes? Which of your characters do you relate closest to? Which of my characters do I relate closest to? Um, you see, most people say, is it Gordon, the middle-aged writer? Is it the bumbling buffoon? But you didn't say that because you are a good person <laughs> with a handsome face. 
and impressive shins. <laughs> um, I relate most to, I don't know, a genius, confident, <laughs> high cheekboned <laughs> um, individual. Um, all of the characters are me in one, you know, one fashion or the other. But um, skullduggery is kind of me on my best day consistently, okay? Um, there's a thing called l'esprit le le d'escalier, which is the spirit of the, st the staircase, which is you're at a party, you're talking to people, someone says something, and you have, you, uh, you, you've got no comeback. And it's, so you leave in a huff. Go, right, get my coat, I'm leaving. And you go down the stairs, and halfway down the stairs, the spirit of the staircase whispers in your ear and says, here's the comeback, here's the perfect line. And you go, well, I'm halfway down the stairs. <laughs> Does me no good. The spirit d'Escalier is whispering in his ear every moment for in, on every occasion. So he is, he is my best. He is me at my best every single moment because we are all capable of the perfect comeback. We are, and, and we, there are, is, is a moment in everyone's life where you can go, oh yeah, okay, I know I've fumbled, and I've mumbled, and I've messed it up, but there's always one moment when I came out on top, and I proved myself to be smarter than whoever it is I was arguing with, and boom, I'm the best. <laughs> so we're all capable of that, that genius, but he just has it all the time. So yeah. Uh, yes, wow, that hand went up fast. I like your shirt. Um, how big a story we've got if Valkyrie was um, the dead skeleton and um, Skullduggery was the dead skeleton? Like, how big a story would be if Okay. How would it have gone if Valkyrie was the dead skeleton and Skullduggery the random teenager? you ask me that? <laughs> it would be great. <laughs> we, the weird thing, okay, when I came up with Skullduggery, right, I had the choice of who a Valkyrie could be. Because yeah, I wrote a conversation between him and someone else about what it's like to be dead. And it turned out she was a girl. And so she became Valkyrie. But the boy, if, he, if Stephanie had been Stephen, the books would be completely different. Because uh, Valkyrie naturally assumed that she was Skullduggery's equal. Whereas if she had been a boy, he wouldn't have assumed that. And in fact, he would have looked at Skullduggery in order to prove himself as a man. Because that's what I would have done. If I had a mentor, I would be always seeking to prove myself. But, but Val, yeah, of course. I'm your equal. In fact, probably better than you. <laughs> so if we it around and Valkyrie was the skeleton, hundreds of years old, utterly cool, and Skullduggery was just like a teenager, it, now it, it it's not quite the same because um, it couldn't be a young boy trying to prove himself against, you know, the, the older male. But um, it would have been about proving. It would have been about establishing himself as a person and not being confident enough to realize I am a person already. I don't need to prove myself to anyone, let alone you, skeleton face, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. There you go. And I like your shirt. Very nice. Yes, at the back, with the, the less amazing shirt. Um, wow. You've forgotten your question, haven't you? Um, your villain character. Yes. Regrets, My villains. Do I have any regrets for the villains? I regret killing most of them. <laughs> um, I would have loved, if I could go back and incarcerate them instead of executing them, um, I, I love the idea of Skullduggery having 
a rogues gallery of villains who are always breaking out of like Arkham Asylum and you know a tormenting a Gotham City all over again. You know, I love that idea. Spider-Man has it, Batman, all of the heroes have their recurring uh, villains. So if I could go back and do it all again, I would keep some of them alive. Um, or at least give some of them octopus arms. <laughs> that would have been awesome. Yes, miss? Um, Two-parter. Two Two-parter. How do you tell people to kill off? Okay. Okay. Um, how do I decide who to kill off? And is okay. I'll do that one first. Um, I ne I don't really create characters in order to kill them off. Uh, it's always a delightful surprise. Um, it and it always serve. It has to serve the story in different ways. My mother told me once. I love this character. And I said, why, mother? Why do you love this character? Well, I love him because, oh, whenever he's on the page, nothing bad will happen. <laughs> said, well, mother, why do you tell me things like this? Because now he has to die. <laughs> I didn't say this to her, but that's what I was thinking. In the very next book, I killed him. And then I went to my mother, and I waited until she got to that point, and I said, See? <laughs> Loose lips sink ships, mother. Um, so, but it all has to be in service of the story. And I killed him because I realized if my mother is comfortable around a character, then all is comfortable around the character, too. So you can ease. You can just, okay, let the breath out. You know, now we're in the gentle part where nothing about all right. No, I cannot have that. You have to be on the edge of your seats at all times. So your second question is, uh, is there anything I can do to make you forgive me in your favorite character? Why would I want to? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm pretty much, I pretty much know who you're talking about. Well, it's either one of three. Um, I just like killing characters. The, the, yeah, it's just so much fun. And yeah, yeah, I'm, I mean, no, I have no regrets about killing anyone. No regrets, none. I'd kill you all if, <laughs> if this wasn't being live streamed, you know, yeah. Okay, how many, okay. Okay, one question left, and then we're going. Ella, okay. Thank you for tuning in. <laughs> um, it. it okay. Okay. Um, basically. Hmm, okay. Nah. <laughs> I have learned to never say never. Um, what, if you had asked me a few years ago, would I be interested in continuing writing about the Skullduggery universe without Skullduggery or Valkyrie in it, I would have said no. Because they're the only reasons that I, I write these books. But since then, and I would have said that around about book six or seven, since then, the, the universe has kept on expanding. And the characters have, are, are constantly proving to be as much fun, the, the side characters, uh, proving to be as much fun as the main characters. So um, now it is not an unfeasible idea for me to write a non-Skullduggery skullduggery peasant. Um, and as for the, the, to be honest, the majority of that question will be answered in until the end. So there, and for those of you who haven't quite there yet, there is a pretty definitive answer. Uh, don't read the back page before you read anything else. <laughs> The amount of people who do that is weird. It got to the point 
where um, I was hearing about this kind of thing. And so in one of the extras, I think it was a Waterstones extra, where we put like extra material at the back of the book just for exclusive things, I wrote a false ending. <laughs> so where uh, it ended with Valkyrie hopping onto a unicorn and <laughs> flying off into the sunset. So all of those people who read the last line first will skip to the last page and go, what? <laughs> Ooh, I can't wait for the unicorn. <laughs> and uh, they never appear. So yeah. Um, and that is all. Thank you, everyone, for uh, um, tuning in um, out there. And uh, for those of you here, I'm going to be signing your books. And if you have any questions to ask, I will sign as I am. I will answer as I am signing. So um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.